All right, everyone. I'm here with Dr. Carrie Rigoni. Welcome to the Unlock the Sugar Shackles podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited you're here. I found your content on Instagram and I was like, oh my goodness, everything she's saying, I need her to come on the podcast. I need her to talk to my students and my clients. And we all need what you are putting out there and what you specialize in. So I'm really, really excited to um, to have you on the show. So first, before we get started, I usually like to ask about my guests' stories. So how did you get into studying the vagus nerve and the nervous system? What is your story there? Yes. So it's kind of um, two pronged in that when I was a newly graduated chiropractor, I um, ended up with chronic fatigue syndrome <clears throat> and um, I was very, very burnt out. You know, I was down the bottom of that deep pit that we can get ourselves into. And, um, you know, I tried absolutely everything I could with supplements and um, nutrition, um, you know, and I was like, oh, no, nah. you know, like I always put the stress response at the, at the end. It's like, no, nah, it's not that simple. You know, it can't be as simple as, you know, meditating or whatever you want to do <laughs> to pull yourself out of the stress response. So I never really got around to de-stressing my nervous system or focusing on my nervous system, which is ironic because um, I was a chiropractor. Um, and then I ended up seeing a practitioner. I used to live in Melbourne. I'm now in Perth, um, who really guided my nervous system out of the stress response. And then what I found was everything worked better. The, the supplements started doing what they're supposed to do. My food actually was absorbed, um, you know, and I, actually, I truly started healing. And now I can say that I'm fully healed from chronic fatigue which I know a lot of people struggle with and are always looking for a solution of how to heal themselves. Um, you know, I've, I haven't had chronic fatigue syndrome for about um, five years now. And um, it, it was when I got the base right, when I got the base of my nervous system right, everything just laid on top of each other. And it was, it was an easier healing process. It wasn't like I was fighting to heal. Um, so kind of I, I have lived experience and then I just realized what I was doing with my patients in my clinic, I felt like wasn't aligned. It wasn't good enough because I wasn't getting to the root of their nervous system issues. So um, I, I've just done so many post-grad trainings on the vagus nerve and the nervous system. And I've just combined it all together to kind of be what I am today. That's awesome. I wish I could take all your knowledge and just insert it into my brain because I just <laughs> want to know so much about this because it's something that resonates with me a lot because I sort of border on that. If I push myself too much, I could go into that state of depletion, burnout, fatigue, and I'm, I'm sort of always living on that edge, living on that line. And I'm, you know, trying to do all the self-care practices, but I know that I'm not doing enough because that sort of gets pushed in the wayside. Just like you said, like, oh, it can't be as simple as that. Like it's easier to take a supplement, right? It's easier to change the <laughs> macros on my plate. It's easier to watch Netflix at the end of the night instead of, you know, so we do take this path of least resistance and, but I want to sort of learn about this for myself, but also for a lot of my clients and my followers and everybody is so stressed out. We have so much stress and whether or not we perceive it to be stress, there's so many other things that can stress us that aren't things like work issues or relationship issues or taxes, like or the government, like those things we know to be stressors, but there's so many other things that can cause stress in our bodies that other people are unaware of, that many people are unaware of. And I see that the number one most underestimated cause of blood sugar dysregulation is stress. And so if we're in this chronically stressed state, it will have manifestations with our blood sugar. And if we are chronically stressed, we will have trouble fully resolving blood sugar issues, especially for my people 
that I work with who have reactive hypoglycemia where their blood sugar keeps crashing all the time. And so, and then I see this with my other clients who just can't get their blood sugar down. So we see it on both ends of the spectrum. And that's sort of the, the link for me in the blood sugar world is that these, the stress response in the body and the lack of being in a non-stress state and doing the healing work is really, really, really contributing. So eventually I'd love to have programs and things where we're, you know, doing this on the regular, but this is all, you know, a seed in my head and it will grow, but it starts with learning from you today. So can you tell us what is the vagus nerve? You mentioned it a few times. Um, Tell us a little bit about what that is and why it's so important. So the vagus nerve is the largest cranial nerve in the body. And um, the word vagus in Latin means wandering and it literally just wanders through your whole body. So it runs from your brain stem, which is at the very bottom of your brain in the most, basically the most primitive part of our brain. It runs through our neck, through our chest through our abdomen and it connects to every organ all the way down to our pelvic floor. Um, Now, some people, when we talk about the autonomic nervous system, you know, remember back to high school biology and they might be like, oh yeah, I sort of remember the vagus nerve. And I think it does something with our heart rate and our blood pressure. And that's very true. So it has um, nerves that go from the brain into our organs that control how fast our heart is racing, how um, how high or low our blood pressure is, um, how fast we're breathing. And, you know, you think about these things, they're really related to this, how stressed we are. Um, but that only accounts for about 10 to 20% of what the vagus nerve does. And then the other 80 to 90% of the vagus nerve fibers actually come from our body up into our brain. And they tell our nervous system you're safe and you're okay to be in a healing phase or a regenerative calm phase, or you're not safe right now, you need to stay in the fight or flight. You need to, you're actually, you need to activate your stress response right now. So it has a really big role to play in what I call the baseline where we spend most of our day, you know, you're talking about always being on the edge. Yeah. <laughs> I can like pick your nervous system, like exactly where it is already, but it, the vagus nerve tells the rest of our nervous system how to respond. Is this a threatening, um, you know, and it responds to internal and external cues. So there's a thing called neuroception, which is how the vagus nerve senses what's going on and tells the rest of the brain what's happening. This can be an internal stress, such as low blood sugar or a gut imbalance um, in the bugs, or it can be an external stress, like um, you know your boss is looking at you with a, an expression that you're not sure if they're mad or not. You know, um, It can be all these little things that happen throughout our day. But whether it's inside the body or outside the body, it sends the same message about stress into the nervous system and says, hey, yeah, your boss it looks really mad. He's probably going to come and yell at you. You need to activate your stress response right now. And so it just does it. And it's all subconscious. We don't even know that it's happening. You know, these nerve fibers work much, much faster than our higher centers do. So it doesn't even reach the rational brain. Only the most important things reach our rational brain. Otherwise, our nervous system is just responding, sensing, responding, sensing, responding all day. Um, And that's how we kind of create this baseline of ability to sit in that regulated state or this baseline of maybe being close to the edge or a baseline of constant fight or flight where you're just not even sure why you're in that state, but you can't pull yourself out of it. Wow. That's such good information. I have so many questions and so many things I want to keep keep talking about. So let's talk about that stress response. Um, I guess that would be a good place to go next. So how you said the vagus nerve activates a stress response. So can you sort of unravel that a little bit more and tell us more about that? Well, the vagus nerve actually is the break on the stress response. So our nervous system is designed that our natural state is stress. 
because that's what keeps us alive. So the vagus nerve actually that's crazy. stops it. <laughs> I'm shocked. Doing no one has ever said us. that. No, I've never <laughs> learned that before. So our natural state is stressed because, yeah. oh my gosh. And then so the well, vagus the nerve. Nervous- system bias like the nervous system is always scanning the environment looking for threat um, rather than safety because your nervous system's job is to keep you alive so it's very easy to activate the stress but what the vagus nerve does is says no don't be stressed about this let's calm you back down so the vagus nerve puts a break on that system and inhibits it so you can already imagine that if your vagus nerve is underactive that it can't give those messages to your brain, then your brain's just going to stay in that fight or flight because it's not being inhibited anymore. Wow. I feel so shaken to my core because I had a totally wrong understanding of that. I've, and I'm really, that makes so much more sense as to why people talk about like toning the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve puts the break on the stress response. So what is the stress response? What is that natural stress, the state of our body? What's happening? What is it called? Um, Can you talk about that? Mm. So the, the stress response activates the sympathetic nervous system and it's sort of like a seesaw. The vagus is parasympathetic. When the sympathetic nervous system is activated, um, you can kind of, did you want me to go into sim- symptoms? Sure. Yeah. You talk or, about whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And so this is kind of like what we call the fight or flight response. So for some of us, it may feel um, like we're really fighty. (laughs) Maybe we're looking to pick a fight. You know, we're in one of those moods and we're like, no, I don't like that. I'm going to pick a fight about that. Or we just feel really defensive and, um, you know, like we feel like people are picking a fight with us when maybe they're not. So we're kind of stuck in that, um, that play where we feel like, we're supposed to be in this fight because physiologically our nervous system is telling us you are in a fight right now so you better like brace up and you know do what you need to do to protect yourself Mm. um so you know and then we've got the um flight response which is more about um running away you know the threat feels so big that you want to run away and hide now this can be as simple as um googling you know escaping to the country or escaping to a, a an island like how many of us have been like I'm sick of this I'm gonna go <laughs> live in the middle of nowhere <laughs> um, would that also can... be just someone it's like I need to plan a trip or I need to leave the situation or like let me, I need to get out of here go to a friend's house go to a bar or something like that yeah so you know storming out um yeah running away to someone who feels safer to you Um, but also just that inner restlessness, you know, when say you try and relax and you sit down and you're like, Oh, I'm just like, I got to do something. I can't just sit here and watch Netflix. Like I need to work or (laughs) I need to scroll Instagram or I need, like, I just can't do this. And it's actually, it becomes a discomfort to calm down because if your vagus nerve is is shut off and saying, hey, there's a threat, you need to stay stressed, then if you try and relax yourself, the vagus nerve is going to be like, no, 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 there's a threat happening. You can't relax right now. You've got to like fight or you've got to run. Like, what are you doing? Why are you sitting watching Netflix? (laughs) I feel like I could, I could literally almost cry hearing this because this is, that's my response. And I feel so restless sometimes. And I feel like I can't stop myself. And I didn't know that that is how stress shows up in me. But now that I see it, it be, it's very, very clear. So that's, that's wild that it's not only like, oh, I need to get out of the country, but that like chronic scrolling, let me just pick up my phone. Let me do something that like trying to escape feeling what I'm, maybe what I'm feeling in the present, or just there's this underlying anxiety. So that's really, really enlightening. Um, yeah, continue. Are, are there any more states of the, of the, that stress system? The other, the other in the fight or flight, which is lesser known, um, is called the fawn response. And the fawn response is the people pleaser. 
it's the person who puts everyone above their own needs. So no matter how you're feeling inside, you feel this urge to make sure everyone around you is happy and comfortable um, to your detriment. And, you know, the reason for this physiologically is that if, you, if your nervous system does feel like it's threatened in any way, then if you're, you're aggress, you know, I'm not saying your family are your aggressors, but let's yeah. say your, your nervous system is looking at them going, oh, I'm feeling like, you know, threatened. I'm going to make my aggressor feel really happy and comfortable because then they're not going to be as threatening to me. It. So it's actually about doing that behavior to try and help you regulate your own nervous system. And that's, that's why, you know, even things like setting boundaries and, you know, like I know Instagram's full of that sort of stuff now and it's awesome. But if your nervous system baseline is fawn and you try and set a boundary, then you're actually fighting your physiology. Like it's, it's a fight. It doesn't feel good um, and it can be really hard to shift. And then we go into shame because we're like, well, why can't I do this? Like, why am I always like this? And it's, well, it's a subconscious. you know we're not even aware our nervous Sorry. system is just doing it Carrie it cut out a little bit um can you tell us again um that you said we go into shame and then what happens and we worry about why we can't do this or why we can't set a boundary or why um maybe we're not we can't stop people pleasing and put ourselves first but it's it's subconsciously driven it's not even a conscious behavior it's our nervous system driving our behavior on a subconscious level wow that it that feels really hard to fix <laughs> when you talk about it like that so is that does it present more challenges in terms of how you improve it or is it about like activating um, the vagus nerve so you can calm your system i don't know yeah, maybe i'm jumping of, ahead <laughs> <laughs> it does depend on the strength of your vagus nerve which you know some research has shown is mostly guided throughout pregnancy you know it's from your womb time so if you have entered the world as a child and been in one baseline state for your whole life then you don't know any different you know as you're learning your, as a child like your lens of the world will be a particular way um, just based on how your nervous system sitting. So you may not be aware of how your vagus nerve is functioning. And to shift subconscious behaviors, we kind of need two, two things. We need a strong vagus nerve. So we do need to activate the vagus nerve. Um, but we also need awareness of what our body is actually doing. And the more we can tune into that awareness, like you say, now you're, you've noticed, oh, yeah, that restlessness, that is a sign of stress. Um, whatever behavior comes up before um, or even feeling in your body, just accessing that awareness going, oh, yeah, I can feel what my vagus nerve is actually telling me to do. That brings it into our conscious brain. And that makes it easier to start to shift, but it's only going to shift as far as your vagus nerve can work well. So how do we know if the vagus nerve isn't working well? I think you've said a few things, but maybe if you could sort of summarize it. So yeah, the vagus nerve, because it pulls us out of the stress response, those with low vagal tone tend to kind of fit into camps. They're either... Um, very much stuck in the fight flight fawn. Um, there is another stage which we haven't touched on yet. We can touch on that oh, later, sure. mm -hmm. which is freeze. That's actually a vagal response. That um, so it's not part of the stress response. Um, but you don't, um, you can't pull yourself out of that. So you're say you get activated and you're triggered by something, and it could be something really small. You're potentially quite hyper vigilant with. Um, your stress response, then you haven't got the capacity to pull yourself out again. So if something bad happens and you have low vagal tone, say like, it's, you know, subjectively bad, say you're running late to drop the kids at school or something, whatever it is, if that happens and then you get, say, 
your heart starts beating faster and you feel really fighty and maybe you start snapping at the kids um, and you can feel your state shift up a notch. And then you drop the kids and it's fine. And really the day should just go on. Everyone's happy, everyone's safe, but you stay in that state. You can't pull yourself out, kind yeah. of ruins the rest of your day. That's, that's when your vagus nerve is not kicking in to say, hey, the threat's over now. You needed to be stressed in that moment, but you can calm down now. So it's a kind of like getting stuck in that state for a lot longer or then needing a lot of things in place to help you feel regulated, you know, like a two hour massage before you calm down <laughs> or like, you know, whatever it is, um, it just takes a lot. You have to really like plan ahead to, to be able to regulate yourself. This is all so enlightening. And I can see this actually, that actually happened to me today. Um, it was a comment on Instagram and I'm like, I can't get over it. I can't, like, I can't stop feeling it. And I couldn't get myself out of that stress response. And I did some breath work. I did tapping and I still felt it. And then I went to the chiropractor. I got an adjustment and I went to the gym and I worked out and I, I don't know what that all did, but I felt like I could finally, like my body could let it go. It's like my mind could let it go before my body could. So is that sort of an example of that? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Happened today. <laughs> so I think, do you see why I needed you on here? <laughs> Selfishly for me. Um, <laughs> so, okay. So let's, swing back and talk about the freeze response because we didn't talk mm -hmm. about that one and then we'll talk about maybe some strategies to um sort of help with the the vagal nerve tone and activating the mm -hmm. vagus nerve because I think I need some of those <laughs> <laughs> so the freeze response is actually part of the vagus nerve the vagus has a ventral and a dorsal branch two different branches um and the freeze response is about <clears throat> sorry um your your stress being so significant that the fight or flight or fawn is no longer working so your vagus nerve activates a fourth state and the freeze response is sort of like if i if i play dead maybe my aggressor won't notice me anymore so and you know this is really when we start dipping into <clears throat> really serious fatigue issues um for the most part and brain fog because your nervous system is actually saying hey like the world is so threatening to you right now can you just go and play dead so it may look like you feel really heavy all the time or it may feel like you can't find your words or maybe you've got no capacity um, to socialize you know like you socializing exhausts you um, you need to sleep way more than usual um, they're probably the big ones um, and you know things like exercise and even going for a walk and stuff just seem like they they make you feel worse and they do because you know physiologically your body's telling you to stay still and then you're forcing it to like go for a run or whatever so your nervous system is like what again what are you doing <laughs> this is not what I need right now I need to play dead so um once we get into the freeze response it just it just shows how, um, how stressed the body is, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So that's sort of more at the end of the line, as opposed to like an earlier stage, mm -hmm. you know, when this starts to show up. Um, yeah. although I'm sure it's, it's been there all our lives, right. For most of us. And yeah. Yeah. So that's, it, it's so interesting. I'm just, I feel like that emoji where it's like the brain is exploding. <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> uh, so some, I would love to talk about how, before we go into those strategies, can we talk a little bit about how we can relate the vagus nerve to blood sugar? So I know I mm. sort of alluded to some of that at the beginning, but you know more of the details than I do. So can we talk about that um, aspect of it? <clears throat> yeah. So really what happens um, when our stress response gets activated and the vagus nerve naturally inhibits because it says, oh, well, there's a, there's a stress happening. You need to be activated. We know that our body 
releases more um, more glucose, really. It says, oh, you need more fuel right now. Like here, have it. And it actually starts to um, inhibit our insulin. So we're stuck in this hyperglycemic state. Now, if you stay in that state for long enough and that stresses your adrenals out, then eventually you will end up with the adrenal related hypo reactive hypoglycemia, which is where I was like, Oh, this is why I started following you in the first place because I was like, yes, she's talking about it. <laughs> um, you know, like I would eat and have to nap for two hours. Like my blood sugar was so bad, but I didn't know it was blood sugar at that time. Like, yeah, I just thought my stomach acid was low or like, you know, something else is happening and probably maybe it was, but it was all blood sugar. And my nervous system had just gotten to that point where it couldn't even regulate its blood sugar anymore. When we get into that stressed out state and the vagus nerve isn't working well, then our blood sugar and our cortisol production will be completely dysregulated and it will be very hard to manage. So, um, you know, I, I actually didn't notice a shift in mine until I started activating my vagus nerve. And then I was like, oh, <laughs> is what it feel like to have regulated blood sugar um so it kind of it just it's like a huge fight to regulate your blood sugar if you're stuck in this sympathetic dominant state because your nervous system is driving you to be activated <clears throat> so it's going to use whatever sugar or whatever fuel you eat anyway any supplements that you take it's going to use that to feed the stress response because that's where it wants to be anyway Wow. So that reminds me of the, um, the, the pregnenolone steel. Are you familiar with that? Mm. Can you, uh, so my understanding is that there is a precursor hormone called pregnenolone and it could be made into cortisol. It could be made into estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, all different hormones, but the body will always prioritize survival, which would be the stress response. You know, it thinks we need to survive and run away from a tiger when really we just need to like respond to an email. Um, and so it's <laughs> going to prioritize survival over reproduction. And so uh -huh. all that pregnenolone that would have been, let's say going towards progesterone and estrogen. So you can have a healthy period and, and feel good at all times of the month. It's being shuttled instead towards cortisol because you have such a high stress response. And so you have this overabundance or this excessive use of cortisol in your system. And then it drives down your sex hormones. Is that the correct mm -hmm. sort of understanding of that? Yeah. Yeah. Perfectly said. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so that is, how does the, the vagus nerve sort of factor into that? Well, the vagus nerve is there's two, there's two parts of the stress response. There is the, um, nervous system stress response, and then there's the hormonal stress response. Ooh. So generally the hormones only respond, say the cortisol production as a result of the nervous system response. So, and the, the, reality is even if we have a nervous system stress response and then it drives the production or the increase of cortisol in our body which is needed in the moment the nervous system response can shut off like if you have strong vagal tone the nervous system response can actually shut off um, pretty rapidly and be like okay now I'm in a regulated state but we know that that cortisol you know that stays in our body it's like a half-life of eight hours so that that overflow effect if we're doing that day in day out our cortisol is just going to be high all of the time <laughs> and then that's going to drive chronic stress patterns on the hormonal level um, and we know that the link between you know cortisol and blood sugar dysregulation is pretty strong so then you end up with blood sugar stuff or insulin resistance or um, you know whatever wow so I yeah so we're what we were talking about before was the nervous system response. And then 
it really, really has, obviously the hormones are released when we have these stressors. And so they can start to really become dysregulated. And we need to remember too, that insulin is a hormone. And so all hormones affect other hormones. So we have the cortisol being released. It's causing the increase in glucose, which is raising our insulin, which is, and it's stealing from the, the sex hormone. So all of these things are interplaying. And so that's, it's, it's important to keep in mind because it, it starts to drive our treatment our like what we need to do. Mm -hmm. We need to look at all of these hormones and, and I guess the foundation that you're talking about. So let's talk about some, unless there's anything else you want to say about the stress response, the hormonal stress response that you think that we should know Mm -hmm. before diving into some strategies. So I think, um, my general approach in the practice is, um, as you say, everything affects everything. So when I get someone's vagus nerve working well, and I get their nervous system able to activate a regenerative state, then I go through a process of what I call like the mopping up of all of the after effects, you know, and that's everything that you talk about there, the nutrition, blood sugar, the sex hormones, um, the adrenal production of cortisol, Um, that stuff doesn't go away immediately just because your nervous system gets rebalanced. You really need to do it all. Um, And especially if it's been like that since birth, you know, your, your body's kind of been in this state, which it feels is familiar since birth, but it can take some time to kind of clean up and rebalance all of those hormones Um, and, you know, get your nutrient profile back. So you're not depleted anymore. Um, It's, it's never, it's never just one system. (laughs) Gotcha. Yeah. And that's, you know, when we talk about (laughs) blood sugar, I talk about so many different things. Like Mm. we have to look at sleep. We have to look at stress. We have to look at movement. We have to look at macros. We have to look at micronutrients. Like there's just so many avenues, but, and so many things to look at, but I think that starting to activate the vagus nerve and, you know, we want to give people a place to start and then we can, you know, there's no rush. (laughs) We want to work on dialing all these things in because like you said, we have probably been in this state our whole lives and it feels comfortable. It feels familiar. It's what we know. So sometimes when I personally feel like I'm under stimulated or maybe in a in a regulated state, it doesn't feel good to my body. It doesn't feel normal. Mm -hmm. So is it possible that people seek out these types of nervous system states because that's what their body is so used to? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) So we will often feel really uncomfortable in states that we're not familiar with. And for most people, that's a regulated state. Um, You know, we're all stuck in this either fight or flight and you know, that is also a spectrum. And the way I describe it is that we kind of hover, you know, it's like a wavelength that can hover in and out. But if our wavelength, the midline is up our baseline, then it's going to hover more in the stress response. And maybe it only dips into the, that parasympathetic vagal response, or maybe Mm -hmm. it's higher. (laughs) And, you know, you're, you're generally like a, stressed type person but then when you're activated the stress response is huge because you're already so heightened um but that can yeah that can absolutely be your familiar and i would say the longer you've been in the fight or flight or freeze the more uncomfortable it will feel for your body to come out of it and go into that ventral vagal state because it's still your nervous system still believes it's fighting something Wow. That is wild. (laughs) So let's talk about, let's get to some tips about how to activate the vagus nerve. You mentioned toning like vagal tone. So improving your vagal tone, is that the right wording Mm -hmm. for that? Yeah. Okay. So what are some basic things to do, um, for this? So there's a really, um, this is so simple that sometimes I feel silly talking about this. Um, there's this really amazing tool you can use. Um, so the majority of the, the vagal fibers that go from your body to your brain come from your heart. 
And these actually then go up into another part of your brain that promotes regulation and self-awareness. So it's a very powerful pathway. And the easiest way for us to activate it in the moment is actually just to focus all of our attention to our heart space. Now, this is actually really hard to start with. Like it sounds very simple, but sometimes you may only be able to focus on that for 10 seconds before that familiar comes in and goes, oh, I'm feeling restless. Oh, I want to scroll. Oh, you know, <laughs> mind starts wandering and thinking about a thousand things. But focusing your attention on your heart area, if you can hold that, you'll notice that your breathing will start to shift. You'll notice that everything will just start to slow down a little bit because we're activating not only the vagus, but the part of the brain, both of them inhibit that stress response. Yeah. Wow. That's wild because I, I took yoga teacher training many moons ago and we asked our instructor what the difference was between meditation and just lying in Shavasana, which is that resting pose where you just lay on the floor at the end of a yoga class, if you've ever taken one. And he instructed us to instruct our future students to focus on the heart space during Shavasana. That was, that's the only thing that I've ever been told. And I think that's so interesting. And I love how it's like we can, some certain practices are in place and we may not have known the science as to why, but now we have the science as to why these types of things might work. Sorry, I think it cut out a little bit on your end. Um, but yeah, that we, we don't have, we knew that something worked like, you know, saying grace before a meal. Um, a lot of cultures pray over their food. Well, the prayer and the, the sitting down being amongst people that activates your parasympathetic nervous system, which allows you to digest your food better. So mm -hmm. it's interesting to see that sort of connection where it's like these customs or practices and their scientific benefit. So I love learning that. That's awesome. And yes, it is difficult because even in Shavasana, <laughs> when you're just laying there at the end of the class, it's like, oh, your mind just drips. So mm -hmm. that's a good practice. That's a great mm -hmm. one. <laughs> Um, the other thing that I love doing rather than like, I mean, there's heaps of um, heaps of ways you can activate the vagus nerve. You know, if you Google it, you can gargle, you can um, put cold water on your face, you can sing. All of these things activate your vagus nerve, but they only activate it to the point that you've got, you know, that it stays within your physiological capacity. So it could be the difference between someone having to, you know, gargle for do one gargle in the shower and feel really good versus having to gargle all day just to feel that vagus nerve start kicking in, you know? So it's only going to work. I do those things as the very last things that I recommend because you're just not going to see really big shifts in vagal tone if you're just doing those things. So what do we do? <laughs> so, <laughs> so aside from the self-awareness, the heart space exercise, a really good way is to actually use the nerves in the face that link in the brainstem to the vagus nerve. So by stimulating them, what we're doing is we it actually creates a sense of safety in that brainstem and allows the vagus nerve. It kind of like opens the floodgates and the vagus nerve naturally works better. And then when it's working better, then you can gargle to your heart's delight. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So um, one of the best ways to do that is actually moving our eyes sideways. So we spend so much of our time converging our eyes in and looking up close at our devices so I'm going to walk you through an exercise which again super easy but I'm going to get you to put your hands on the back of your head like at the base of your skull and just lift your chin a tiny bit holding your head where it is I'm going to get you just to move your eyes horizontally not too far that you're pushing it just far enough that it kind of feels a little bit hard and fixate on something and you literally just fixate your gaze and you hold it 
and you should feel some sort of a sigh or a release. Now, again, if you're not used to activating your vagus, it may take a long time. <laughs> and then when you feel it release, you can go to the other side and do the same thing. So you hold the gaze. We're just moving sideways. Now, mine, I do that a lot. And, um, you know, it probably activates within about 10 to 20 seconds, depending on how stressed I am. But the first time I did it, I think I had to hold it for about three minutes. And I was like, is this coming? Like, <laughs> am I doing it right? <clears throat> and afterwards, I had to have a big nap because my vagus nerve was like, yes, this is amazing. Let's get regenerating. Um, I just yawned, by the way. Yeah. I took a really deep breath yes. and I yawned and my whole body feels almost like I took some sort of a substance. It's <laughs> wild what I feel right now. I feel yeah. so different. I could, I feel a little, not, not lightheaded, but it's interesting the, the physiological shift that just happened <laughs> from doing that. That's mm. phenomenal. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And another one I'll finish with one final exercise um, that you can do is just putting pressure on your chest bone. So I like to use my fingertips. You can use a heavy book if you really wanted to, but you're kind of on the chest bone, but to each side, just a little bit. And you just put pressure with your fingers quite deep, hold it in. And again, you should feel some sort of yawn or a sigh. It should feel really good. Nice. That I one think I'll creates... have to hold that one a little bit longer, but it started, it's, <laughs> it's definitely feeling good and I feel really different. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. So what's, tell me again, the difference between, so doing the things that how is it? <laughs> I don't know what I don't know. So it's stimulating the, let's compare the gargling to the side looking, the horizontal looking. What is the difference between what those things are doing? So the sideways looking or the pressure on the chest is creating a physiological sense of safety. So it's doing a practice that tells your nervous system it is safe to not be stressed. And then the vagus nerve says, oh, that's me. I'm going to come in now and I'm going to act, I'm going to kind of wake up again. So stress, it no matter your vagal tone, stress inhibits the vagus nerve. So the more stressed you are, the less the vagus nerve can work. So what the, those exercises do is says, actually you're safe vagus nerve. Can you start kicking in and doing your job? So it allows it to work better. Things such as gargling and singing, they simply stimulate the vagus nerve. We need the vagus nerve to work, to, to be working as we're doing those activities, but it can still be inhibited on a grander scale. So if the nervous system is still inhibiting it, yes, you'll still be able to sing, like it's not completely, it's not like it's been cut, um, but you won't be able to activate. It won't open those floodgates for the vagus nerve to be like, yes, I see what you're doing. And I do, I do recognize that safety you've created and I'm going to work harder now. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for clearing that up. And have you, do you work a lot with HRV heart rate variability? Yeah. So I do have a HRV in my clinic. So I, um, on the initial consult, an adult will get a HRV assessment and then we actually don't do anything with it until I feel like I've activated their vagus nerve and enabled it to work well and I feel like we've kind of gotten rid of a lot of those inflammatory markers you know all of that mopping up stuff and then I will get them back on and see what's shifted and a lot of the times it's just naturally shifted on its own and if not then we can go through a process of retraining the vagus nerve to stay more regulated and to start activating. Awesome. And so where does, where does breath work sort of fall into your practice? Um, breath work is more towards the end. You, you tend, depending on the type of breath work, some of it can actually be quite activating. Um, and if you're trying to drive a healing 
response, then some of it's going to be counterintuitive. Um, and the other thing to notice with breathwork is um, just kind of how, how easily you're probably still going to be flipped into your familiar state. <laughs> so I don't use breath work until I'm right at the very end um, and I'm confident that their nervous system is quite regulated in and of itself. Gotcha. Okay. And <laughs> if someone, so let's say someone like me wants to start doing some of these vagus nerve things like the pressing the chest and the horizontal eye movements, my, my first thought was, I want to get up and do this every morning. But then I thought that's when we sort of want that, that cortisol, you know, early spike, we want to be in a sympathetic so we can sort of take on our day. Um, mm -hmm. Would that, so when would you recommend doing these exercises? Um, to start with, what I usually recommend is doing the physical exercises when you're feeling like you're stuck like you were today and you can't pull out of it mm -hmm. um, and, doing, um, and doing it before bed. And then what I actually recommend is starting to try that um, heart attention practice when you're already feeling good. So if you have a moment where, say, <clears throat> you look over at your family and you're like, man, I'm so grateful for you guys. Like, I'm just so, yeah, I love you guys so much. Then anchor that in, like tell the vagus nerve, oh, that's what I want more of. Mm. So I tend to encourage people to do it. Yeah, that one when they're feeling really good and need a little bit of an anchor. And then the other creates that rapid shift in how safe their nervous system feels. But yeah, doing it first thing in the morning could be counterintuitive. <laughs> okay, <laughs> got it. So definitely um, maybe would you also say after just sort of after something that is more stimulating or more stressful, whether it's like exercise or, um, you know, a stressful Zoom call or something. So maybe anchoring yourself and bringing yourself out of that stress response, would that be beneficial as well? Yeah, absolutely. So okay. the, I mean, the end goal is that um, the Vegas works so well on its own that you remain regulated despite the stress around you so you can see the stress going on or you can say see the comments on instagram whatever and be like oh yeah cool well that's water off a duck's back because my nervous system is anchored so you can still activate that stress response but still regulate your heartbeat and regulate your ability to pull out like you're in charge of when you're you're pulling out of that as opposed to being completely subconsciously driven um, by things that yeah we're just not even aware is happening wow so interesting another one of the, another vagus nerve sort of trick that i learned was has to do with the ear and so putting like there's different parts in the ear i know that the vagus nerve is sort of innervated through that ear so a lot of things with the ear, like pulling on the ear and things like that can sort of help as well. And I felt that same sort of response where if I make these circular motions in this certain spot of my ear, it's almost like the whole half of my face kind of gets like <laughs> weak. So is that sort of, is that another one that you use in your practice or other strategies? Yeah. yeah that's similar to the eye exercise one. So that's yes. using the nerves in the face and head to drive the safety response into the brainstem, which will alter the vagal tone. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And you mentioned that the vagus nerve hits every organ and that's every, or like every organ. Mm. So how does that, how does the loss of tone impact all the organs then? Well, yeah, that's very individual. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, but when we lose vagal tone, we know that um, the vagus nerve controls a lot of, um, well, the vagus nerve is very anti-inflammatory. So when we start losing vagal tone, we just start getting dysregulation of our inflammatory processes. How that, how that manifests in each person is going to be very different. You know, it's not going to be that every organ is going to shut down and it's, you know, um, dire straits, but it could be, you know, that say, 
it is relating to the pancreas or it is relating to um, the lower digestive tract and it controls how, how we move our food through. So, you know, people with low vagal tone tend to have you know, more diagnoses of irritable bowel or um, sort of like those blanket digestive issues that no one can really give a label to, but um, you know that something's not quite right. Um, more likely to have um, period pain and um, menstrual irregularities. You know, it just kind of, it's a layer on whatever else is happening inside that person's body. Yeah, and it's interesting that you mentioned the digestion and the period pain because that's hormonal. So in my mind, the connection I'm seeing here is that the stress state is that primary state, right? And then all those other things like digestion and reproduction, those are secondary to being alive. And so if you're in a chronically stressed state because you have poor vagal tone, or I don't know if it's only because of that, but if you're in this chronically stressed state, that what will happen is that these secondary things like reproduction and digestion are going to suffer. So we can sort of allude that if you have those issues, you're probably spending too much time in a stress state. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Interesting. I like it. <laughs> and even, you know, the nervous system, there's a saying that it like the nervous system doesn't care if you're happy or not. It just cares if you're alive. And so, you know, even anxiety and mental health things, if we're stuck Ooh, in yeah. this chronic stonic chronic state of stress um the nervous system doesn't care in that moment because it's just it's working on this fight or flight response that your whole body has perceived it needs to be in wow awesome this is such good information do you have anything else that you are sort of lit up about lately or or something you find interesting that we haven't talked about no I think we've covered most of it Okay. Awesome. I did know that I did see some posts that you had about children and their yeah. nervous system states. And so I know a lot of my listeners are parents. And so maybe that would be helpful to go into the, those systems of maybe fight flight fawn with, mm -hmm. with kids, because I think mm -hmm. it manifests differently. And maybe we can also make some connections. We might have made a connection for ourselves now, but maybe can see this pattern also showing up for ourselves as children um, to kind of see how long we've been sort of stuck mm -hmm. in that state. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I do see a lot of kids in my practice because nervous system dysregulation becomes behavior dysregulation. Mm. <laughs> um, and, you know, I love, while I love seeing adults, I do also have a real passion for helping parents prevent these chronic stress issues in kids you know like if they're manifesting behaviors now and it's not sorted and their nervous system develops like this then you know they're more likely to end up where we are now <laughs> with yeah. all of our adult issues um, and I don't want you know any child to have to go through what I went through um, so yeah the states become more like kids are just more um, I guess they're more primitive in general because they haven't got the higher centers yet. Their higher center brain is still developing. So when they experience a stress response, it often looks a lot more like the, like, I guess the traditional descriptor of the response, you know, like, so we might be able to try and regulate the, the flight response by scrolling, whereas they don't really have that option. They're probably like, you know, a child in the flight response will run like literally run away <laughs> if, they, if they feel like they're being threatened um you know whether it's by another child or um, they feel like they're about to get in trouble etc um you know the kids who just they're like a bolting horse and the mums are always chasing after them um but that can also look like a child who runs a lot in play and that's not to say that all running is bad because you know all kids run but you know you can just you know your child when they're just that notch up a bit <laughs> you know they just like can't stop or they just can't take a breather they just have to keep moving and doing um and then kids in the fight response oh, I um, had one question about the flight oh, um yeah. would would that also be 
a kid who maybe like if there's a group of kids playing and it's kind of maybe too much and the, the kid maybe prefers to play on their own? Um, oh, that's a complex one. Um, yeah. A child who wants to play on their own, I mean, it could be, could like be a just bunch. personality, but yeah. I mean, the vagus nerve, the ventral vagus has a big role to play in how much we want to socialize and socially engage. So a child who really isn't showing interest in playing with other children, um, you know, aside from general personality quirks, um, could very well have low vagal tone. Um, because they just haven't got enough drive for social engagement. Interesting. Mm. Got it. And you were saying the flight response in chi in children? The fight? Fight, yeah. Um, is, yeah, they just seem to always feel like they're in trouble. They explode a lot. Um, often once they explode, you can't regulate with them. So um, co-regulation is really hard. You almost have to let them go um, they might throw things or hit or um, you know get really aggressive um, and the, most of the time afterwards they feel remorse you know and they're like I'm so sorry that I did that um, but in the moment they just can't control it because they're literally fighting for their life physiologically so the threat is so big for them that um, they will yeah literally fight wow yeah. Um, I used to be a pediatric speech therapist and a lot of kiddos are <laughs> coming to mind <laughs> as you're talking. Mm -hmm. um, and then the fawn response in kids? The fawn response is, um, I think it's more common in little girls. <laughs> um, and it's like the, the friend who, who the friend and it's the little girl who just says yes to play with her friends you know you can see she doesn't want to say yes to what's going on but she also really wants to please her dominant friend or um you know stay in the group and not be excluded from the activity because we're safer in groups um so they tend to just you know be a little bit shy a little bit like go along with the crowd even though you can see that they don't want to gotcha wow yeah interesting but you're like you said, it's a little bit more primitive because they don't have <laughs> those sort of other coping behaviors or that knowledge that it's not socially appropriate yet or something like that. Really interesting. Mm. So how do you work with kids to regulate this response? Because I'm sure a lot of parents are like, I need the help. <laughs> I need help to regulate my kids. And I don't know if I can make them look to the side or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Um, so in the clinic, I do very much the same, um, but in, in my online coaching, it's very, it's more about, um, creating that bond again between parent and child, creating that safe anchor and then getting the parents to create the safety inside. So, I mean, you can still get a child to look sideways, but it might be a game. It might be like, which thumb is wiggling, you know, like yeah. let's put our thumbs out and see, or yeah. let's put stickers on the wall and let's see who can look at it the longest. Or um, it's very gamified, but physiologically it's, it's basically the same. Wow. Yeah. Really, really interesting. And I hope that's helpful for a lot of people. So you mentioned an online program. How can people find you? How can people work with you? So the easiest way to find me will be on Instagram. So my handle is Dr. Carrie Rigoni. Um, and yeah, that will link you through to my website through all of the offerings that I've got at the moment. I have some one-on-one um, -on -one if you happen to be in Australia. Um, and I do have some coaching, which is either group format or um, individual. Awesome. Do you do, uh, do you do one-on-ones for virtual clients as well? Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Just because I'm sure a lot of people will be heading your way. <laughs> so thank you so much for all of this information. I feel so enlightened and I feel like this is an, a simple practice that I can add in or, and just a really great tool to use if I'm stuck in that state and I'll practice it. I'm going to teach it to my wife because I know that 
um, you know, I see the pattern that she has. I'm not going to call her out. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I see my pattern. Hers is different and I can see it. And it's interesting how it shows up in, in you know, different people and you can sort of notice it in people who you're close to. And it's helpful to know that. So I might know when she's triggered or when, when I am. And so again, that's that awareness piece. And so I really appreciate all this information and I'll have to report back to you and let you know <laughs> how, uh, yes. how things are going. <laughs> and one last thing, selfishly, you mentioned, you kind of know where my nervous system is because I'm like <laughs> on the edge. Can you <laughs> tell me a little bit more about that? <laughs> Yeah, look, someone who's on the edge is someone who's very, very familiar with fight or flight and feels like, like you said, very uncomfortable shifting into that ventral vagal, that regulated state. Um, and it means that almost if you push that regulated state too hard, then your nervous system is going to go the complete opposite way. So you're going to be kind of oscillating very much on the edge um, a lot of the time. And for you, I would suggest that you go really gentle and you kind of want to do like baby steps backwards away from that edge rather than um, notice one big shift because you'll, you will, um, you'll probably like rebound, rebound. like a trampoline. <laughs> wow. And that, yeah. that advice to tread lightly, that hits my personality so hard because I mean, I started keto with a three day fast and I had hypoglycemia. I'm like, don't do that. You know, I, it's, and a lot of my people are like this in my program. I mean, half of what I do in my coaching program is slow people down because they're doing too much too soon. So I think this is a really beautiful, valuable lesson and I will take it to heart. And I think that's good because I'll, I could tend to want to immerse myself, but then I'm kind of busy. So I don't really have time for all of that. So I will, I will go slowly and I will take heed that beautiful advice. So I don't do too much. too soon. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for those words to the wise. So um, thanks so much for being here, Dr. Carrie. I love this conversation and I can't wait to hear more from you and, and dive into more of your content. Do you have a, you don't have a podcast, but you have the, the online programs. All right, great. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah.